I'm Michael Hughes. I am the current Vice President of Global Business Development with ARPAN International Group. I spent most of my life as an expat myself, uh, mostly in Asia. I was 15 years in China, a little bit in Cairo, and also in South Korea. And um, my background was in cultural, uh, cross-cultural studies, comparative religions, languages, you name it. And what I find super interesting about transversing between Latin America all the way up to North America, including Central America, is the differences in cultures. And we're talking about pretty much half the globe. So while there may be unity in terms of languages with a lot of these countries, there is a complete difference in terms of economies, cultures, um, and family demographics that really infl- um, uh, impact a relocation. So that's me. I'm going to pass it over to Andy Eines. And Andy, would you like to introduce yourself as well? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, from here in sunny Dubai. Uh, uh, my name's Andy McInnes. Uh, I'm the regional director for ARP in Middle East and India. Um, I've been in the relocations industry for 15 years now, and I've worked with ARPIN for many of those years. Me, I've finally seen the light and joined ARPIN as well. Um, I've been an expat myself for a long time, almost 30 years. Uh, despite my youthful looks. And uh, that's been across six countries in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Um, So one thing that I find particular when it comes to moving people around the world, not just within North and South America, um, it is doing as much as possible to keep customs happy. Now, this is something that can be a challenge to do, um, sometimes assignees or transferees aren't be when they get told that they should not be sending food to where they're going because customs doesn't permit. But, um, you know, really what we're trying to do is save them from as much potential problems as, as we can, because the last thing that anybody wants when they've waited for their shipment to get to destination for the last six weeks or whatever, and then it gets held up in customs um, because the customs officials have found things in the shipment that shouldn't be there. So, uh, you know, that's that's really something that's very important. We're trying to help you. We might be the messengers of news that you might not want to hear, but it's for your own benefit. So uh, with, with that, I shall pass you back over to, to Michael. Wonderful. And Andy, that's amazing background. Six different countries. Um, so those of you who don't, we're we're in the household goods side of the business. Um, there are many suppliers and vendors that support each vertical in the relocation, mainly from a real estate, immigration tax, and household goods. We're going to be talking today mainly from the household goods perspective, where we're an expert and uh, where we focus on our service scope. We jump into it. Um, Andy, do you want to kick us off with some of the beginning questions that we had from the audience about sure. relocating to the Americas? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, as Andy mentioned earlier on, we've had 26 questions come through, which is fantastic. Um, some of those have been very, very similar. Um, and some of those we've tried to, uh, what's the word, interpret as best as possible, hopefully. Um, I'm going to be asking the question that has actually been put to us in the way it was intended. So uh, the the first one here with regards to relocation services and logistics in the the Americas, um, someone has asked, what companies other than U-Haul have affordable DIY shipping options for domestic U.S. or Canada moves? Michael. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go into that one first. Um, so the question about the DYI versus uh, the kind of support and moving um, perspective, there are a lot of companies out there. Um, you can see some of them up here as well. Um, and the difference is, I mean, well, these can be cost effective options. Uh, I love this picture with the U-Haul and the SUV stuck in the back. Um, it really leaves the experience of getting ready for the move up to the transferees themselves. And in some situations, this may be appropriate. Um, Some hires, for example, that are coming on board, whether um, intern programs or um, early um, career programs that are bringing on talent um, can have a great advantage of a do-it-yourself program. 
Um, however, if, if you're looking at solving the problem of smaller shipments and taking care of the efficiency of those relocations, uh, we do encourage the exploration of what is typically called the containerized program. Uh, there are many, many programs out there with different moving companies, uh, but the difference here from a traditional quote-unquote van line model is when you're using containerized programs, there's a few advantages. There's first and foremost, they're using commercial transportation, which means that you have a much quicker speed. So if you're not familiar with how things get moved, particularly across North America, uh, South American story because of many countries and customs in between, but if you're moving across the United States or even across from, from Canada, a lot of times what happens is one truck will pick up goods along the way and they'll weave throughout the country and they'll set up a route that makes sense as much as possible in terms of delivery and pickups. Uh, what this means for your employees and also the people that are coming to work for your offices around the around the U.S. is that they don't really know when they're going to get their stuff. They will be usually given a window of time uh, and that is term. Um, so they'll say, hey, we'll be there probably the second week of October. Uh, we'll give you a call when we're in your state or we're in your city. And while that can be um, good for larger shipments because they can handle more, for smaller shipments that we see more common these days, it's really a nuisance because if you're scheduling your travel, if you're scheduling your work and projects and all these kind of things, and you don't have specific dates for when your items are actually going to arrive so you can plan for that, uh, it leaves a lot of things up in the air. I went back to the U.S. two years ago and can to attest to that, um, the difficulty and planning your schedules and first into the job that you're supposed to be doing because you're waiting for things to wrap up with your relocation. So with small small shipments and containerized programs, they use commercial transportation, which, mean, which means that you're using carriers that are going frequently, sometimes dozens of trips from east to west coast each day, and you're able to lock in time frames. So you can tell the employees and, and can inform your employees an exact date of arrival in advance so the employees can prepare for that. Transport time is also quicker and, and uh, shorter, but also you will have the advantage of um, having someone come into the home, take care of the items for you, packing them, loading them professionally, and you don't have to be burdened with doing that. If anybody's ever moved their home, uh, this can be a really, really big burden. Um, for smaller shipments as well, just getting ready, uh, preparing them, just the physical labor itself. You can see on the right-hand side of this screen, we have what we call uh, lift vans are traditionally built to transport on a commercial freight. Uh, and this is what of, often is used in containerized programs. You can see what's inside here is a bicycle, a couch, and, you know, a few office items, tables and chairs. Um, it's not too many things, but generally speaking for employees that have a one bedroom or a studio apartment, this is a great solution. It's also a much cheaper solution as well. And for the moving companies, it's easier to come into a home, pack up the items, put them in these lift vans, and then transport them over commercial freight carriers to the to the destination at a much cheaper price and a much quicker time frame. Uh, so it's an option to keep an eye out for. So I would recommend for any of the suppliers that you're working with in the household goods, ask them about their containerized programs, ask them what, what they do and how they uh, support small shipments. And that can be a great option rather than just having the employees go do it by themselves via U-Haul or pods. Um, it, there's certain risks as well, especially when you're using these um, DIY methods. Uh, you can see the trailers for for um, Zippy Shell and U-Haul and stuff, great companies. Uh, but it's it takes a little bit of talent and skill to drive these, and especially if you go in cross country, that can be incredibly difficult as well. Andy, what was the next question we had? I think it was okay. um, along so, the lines of how do we get estimated quotes? Accurate cost for an international move estimate. That's a great question, and. Um, for most of the situations in the industry, um, it's best to get an actual quote for the actual items that are being moved. Um, there's a lot of rate sheets out there. Um, there's a lot of opportunities where your a company can ask a, a moving company or a um, relocation company to help put together an RFP type model where you have flat rates. So if you're moving, let's say, from California to New York, you get a flat rate 
uh, and then you can break it down by pounds and weight allowances, etc. The problem with that is that it's very hard to assess your yourself how many pounds of goods do you have when you look at your house. Like, is this two thousand pounds or is this five thousand pounds? Um, it, it's quite difficult to assess for that. But also at the same time, too, um, everybody comes from a different situation. Everyone comes from a different kind of habitation. So condos versus standalone homes uh, versus ranches uh, out here in Texas, of course. Um, there's all these differences in terms of what people are shipping. So we do recommend that if you want to get an accurate quote, uh, and most of these are provided free. So you can see at the top of the slide here, we've got virtual moving technologies, a Goyu, Yembo. Um, there's quite a few that do virtual surveys, and it's quite easy for your employee to use the app on their phone, do a survey through out their home just walking and recording what items they're planning on shipping they get a inventory list and then they're able to give that to a moving company a moving company can give them an accurate price based on the origin destination as well as the destination that they're moving to um, with this itinerary so we really highly recommend getting a survey done so you can get an accurate cost and like i said these are free and they can be done at any time at the convenience of your employee as well yeah, so I, if, if I can just add, Michael, um, you know, I think over the last few years, especially since the pandemic, uh, something that has become a lot more common is the use of the virtual surveys. Um, and there are applications that can be used by the moving companies. So that means that they don't specifically have to come into your home. They can connect with the individual who is is moving without, you know, being there, but through the phone and the power of, you know, as long as you have Wi-Fi, um, they can see what would like to be moved and and still go through a lot of information over the over the phone call and the video call as well. So you know that that can be a very good option if you have somebody who's moving in perhaps a, a remote destination or you know somebody who's not going to be easily uh, surveyed within a regular working hour. Um, so yeah, just thought I'd drop that one in, Michael. Okay, so the next one is actually with regards to uh, the relocation trends and employee perceptions. Okay, so that question was, companies are starting to take the skills best approach when it comes to recruiting. So that's kind of more of a statement, but um, yeah, I, I Perhaps that's the, that's the case. I mean, well, what we're seeing, especially um, in the Americas, is definitely a change in the type of employees that are moving. Uh, and shipment sizes obviously reflect that. Uh, but if we can kind of look into some of the locations of these mm -hmm. trends and changes, uh, what we've done is tried to break this down into a few categories that will help to uh, take a look at these. And I'm going to actually slide this up a little bit because it looks like um, that's not showing on everyone's screen. So let me pull that up there for you. Ba -ba -ba. Here we go. Okay. There we go. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Intermission. There we go. All right. So, um, Andy, to answer that question in terms of trends and what we can see happening, uh, we'll take a look at each of the main countries that we have folks um, that ask questions about. Uh, but also we have a majority of relocations happening to obviously a dozen plus countries uh, in between uh, North. But what we're looking at here is some of the more common ones that we see relocation going in and out of and some of the more uh, prominent locations where international companies have investments and have had um, their employees relocate to. So with with the first one we can look at is actually here in Brazil. Um, and if we break down some of the things that is important to understand about, but first off, um, in terms of the business, um, things to know, the business is really driven by a lot of outside decisions from Brazil. So, and this is in terms of international relocation. So, um, we'll get into the types of companies, et cetera, that exist within Brazil that are, are huge and 
you know, um, the economies around those. But a lot of the international implications and those decisions are being made outside of Brazil. So the conversations that we had with folks on the ground in Sao Paulo um, and Rio de Janeiro, for example, we're talking about how that affects the programs and the availability of services that are locally provided for, because most of these decisions are being driven, let's say, in North America, United States, when these transferees are going through, um, that they may not consider all the unique uh, aspects of the country that the employees are moving into. Another thing to know about as well is that in terms of a breakdown, and, and this is just a general breakdown, it's not an exact um, reference, but to get an idea of um, the, the size and the, the um, aspects and geography of uh, Brazil in terms of relocation, um, Sao Paulo tends to really be the tech center and auto and agriculture driven. Um, Rio, de, uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, tends to be big in oil and gas. Uh, and those are kind of the majority trends there. Some of the challenges that people face when they're moving into Brazil um, is especially the shipping and customs timelines. And Andy, you hinted about this a little bit earlier with your introduction. Um, customs is, is always something that is quite um difficult for employees to um, get their head around. Um, it's a part of the shipping program that is outside of the control of any of the movers you use. And this is very frustrating, especially for corporations that rely on their movers to provide solutions. Um, but as you understand the kind of the entire process flow of a move, the shipment passes through the actual pack and crews into vessels that are controlled by shipping companies and then in through to customs which are controlled by governments. So while the moving company is managing this process and helping to orchestrate this symphony for lack of a better word of operations, there are a lot of people that are involved that are completely outside of the control and influence of the moving companies and customs tends to be one of them. Um, one of the other challenges is also the expectations and compliance. And this was quite interesting when we were talking to um, our friends in Brazil and one of some of the struggles that they were saying that they were having, especially working with relocations. And the biggest one that kept being kind of reintroduced to conversations was the expectations of the employees coming into Brazil. And they were saying that everyone expects, well, this is Brazil, we can do whatever we want, or this, we can get whatever we need to get done. Uh, and that's not the case. And I think helping to set those expectations from foreigners that are entering into Brazil is a really important aspect to understand that um, compliance is extremely important, um, setting those expectations that guidelines need to be followed, um, whether it's legalistic, whether it's a, a notarization of, you know, several dozen documents that are required for customs. Um, these are requirements and there's no way to get around it um, because it is essentially uh, regulations enforced by the government. Um, the next challenge is, as well as local disruptions that happen in the market, for example, strikes and these kind of things um, that happen. Some countries tend to have more um, issues than not, but of course, this is going to largely affect anything in terms of shipments coming in and out of the country. Um, and one thing I would also note, too, is that for companies that are managing these relocations on behalf of their employees, uh, it's really important to understand that when it comes to a shipment of their household goods, this is a privilege, it's not a right. Uh, and I think that's a really important distinction to make because when a shipment comes into the country, it's actually treated as a special exemption from taxes. So it's not a commercial cargo where the government will levy any taxes on it. Um, so from whether it's Brazil or any other country, to be honest, really looks at these type of shipments as a privilege for uh, people to without having any taxes applied to them. And also at the same time as well, these shipments are far smaller than the volume that you have from commercial freight. So you can just imagine, you know, vessels carrying 3,000 plus containers and maybe 20 of them are household goods out of out of a maximum. I mean, that I think even that would be inflated numbers. Um, so how that affects your employees as well is they don't take priority in terms of clearance and they don't take priority in terms of speed. Um, so a lot of times some employees will want to push these through. They want to expedite. They say, you know, I, I uh, whatever position I have for whatever international company, um, I should have the ability to fast track this. Um, there are processes and those processes need to be respected. And I think that's important uh, when 
briefing the employees that are moving into the country to let them know that, hey, when you go through this transition process, there may be challenges, there may be timelines that are extended beyond your initial expectations. You need to be prepared for that and you need to have a backup plan. For example, like an air shipment where you're taking smaller immediate items with you, um, you're not packing items that you need right away when you get into country into your sea shipment, but you're carrying those with you as carry-ons, you have excess luggage, or you have an air shipment that would come a little bit quicker as well. Some of the trends as well um, for Brazil that are in the positive um, light is um, there are recent law amendments in favor of the international workforce. So there's been kind of a trend shift where in the past, the labor workforce was really uh, focused on providing opportunities for local Brazilians. Um, however, recent immigration laws and updates have been really focused on providing an opening avenue for international workforces coming into Brazil. So um, international talent and all those kind of things. The good thing, it also kind of complicates applications, those type of things, but it also uh, puts a positive light on the focus of the country in, in terms of growth and international talent. Um, the next trend as well is that while things can be complicated uh, and there's a lot of th barriers to be broken down, the government is really trying to work towards making things smoother. And for example, one kind of hard case example of this is the requirement on notaries. If anybody has handled the customs into Brazil or worked with their employees who have done uh, uh, importation into Brazil, every single document needs to be notarized. Uh, and these requirements are being updated. So in the future that this would be a much easier streamlined process than it is now um, and a, less, a little bit less uh, bureaucratic from the documentation side. Um, once that's released, we'll, of course, we'll provide notices to our clients and our customers but that's a positive light. Some things to watch out for, um, and this is an important one, some things that uh, may not be so obvious. There are a lot of things, and we'll take some questions from the audience after because I'd love to hear from the, um, the teams that are from these locations and based in these areas that can provide further comments. But this section about watch out are these are the aspects that may not be so commonly known or considered. Um, so, for example, you may have noticed we did not talk about things about like safety and those kind of things. Um, obviously, for people that are moving into different parts of the world and, and for different scopes and roles, there are certain um, aspects of debriefing, security protocols, those kind of things. So those are things that are, are more aware of and prepared for. But from the watch out section, we really want to look at some, some things that are not so obvious, but are causing pain points. And two of these, the first one is bond management. Uh, and the second one is the notarization of documents. Um, so this is really important for the employees just to be aware of, because even though the, those processes will be updated in the future, they do have to have documents notarized. And if you're an expat and you've left your country already, to get a document notarized is really, really difficult because um, sometimes it has to be at origin where, where the document was released. Uh, sometimes there's special requirements on who can actually do that and you have to be present in person, etc. Um, so there's a lot of um, complications around that. I do want to dive into a little bit about bond management because Andy, if I'm not mistaken, we did have a, a question about that. Uh, but before I do, um, actually, you know what, I'm going to jump into that first and I'll go back to that. Um, one of the questions we had was, uh, um, Andy, if you mind reading the question, it was about bond management into the Americas. Yeah. I'm not sure if you have it in front of you. Sorry, to put you I, I don't think I do. <laughs> there's there's a couple of more ge more generic questions, but uh, not specifically about bond management that I have in front of me now. Um, so I'll just address this um, is for any shipment going into multiple countries in Latin America, Argentina being another one of them, um, Chile as well, um, spe specifically Brazil is when a shipment comes in, like we said before, this is kind of set as a privilege, not a right, where the employees are allowed to have their shipment tax exempt. Um, however, how Brazil handles this is they ask you to pay those taxes up front as a deposit. And then when you leave the country and you bring all of those goods down to the single item, so you can't throw anything away. If you're there for four years, you have to keep exactly everything to take out of the country. Then you can apply for that money to be refunded. Uh, of course, nobody wants to put thousands and thousands of dollars into actual cash deposits. Uh, so there are various options through company guarantees, etc. cetera. Uh, but one of the most common ones is insurance bonds. And what essentially this means is um, the employer will purchase 
purchase an insurance coverage for the cost of those duties and taxes on behalf of the employee and provide that to the customs officials so that they would allow the shipment to be imported. And if that shipment is not exported, um, then they would have the right to claim the taxes and to receive that money. Now, this is a very complicated process because it involves a lot of the local teams to make these applications. Um, and at the same time as well, it's not something that's common in terms of relocation programs across the globe. So it's not quite expected of one who's responsible for this from the company side, because a lot of uh, whether it's HR, whether it's legal, whether it's whatever team or admin is supposed to be responsible for this. But also at the same time, from a supplier standpoint, it's not quite clear who's responsible for this. And I say that because um, it's not just applying for the bond, it's also managing the bond as well. Because once you actually have the bond, it's linked to your residency permits. So those expiration dates are linked to the the expiration of the bond. And let's say, for example, if you do a visa renewal, that bond has to be renewed as well. And if it's not renewed, then your lives and those taxes could be upwards of you know tens of thousands of dollars. So it's, it's a really critical element to keep an eye on and, and uh, be aware of. The benefit is that on an importation, most moving companies will help to apply for these bonds. So you have that covered. But it's really the management of these bonds that is actually quite critical. Because when an immigration process happens, Happens, they are not quite responsible for the bond side of it. And because the move has already been completed, the mover is already out of the picture. So you may be talking about an employee that's moved in. Let's say they're on a, a one year or even a two year residence permit. That residence permit expires. They decide to renew. So now they're there for four years. Well, that moving company worked with your employee two years ago. So that relationship is kind of considered a little bit um, dated. And then when those permits are updated, nobody's really directly responsible for, for managing that bond. So one of the things that we've built for a large pharmaceutical company, as well as an oil company that uh, has operations in Brazil, from our side, we built actually a program that manages this. So you're able to enter all the employee information, you're able to track those expiration dates, and you're able to look at that and have alert notices sent through emails, et cetera, when those um, bonds are going to expire and how to stay on top of them. So it's really not just the application, it's the management of it. And again, if you don't manage it correctly, you could be on the hook for tens of thousands of dollars. The, the next point, the, there was there was several people who, who simply stated that, you know, for, for relocations into Latin America, Brazil certainly seemed to be the most uh, challenging. Um, and I think you probably covered a lot of the reasons why just over the last five minutes there, Michael. So um yeah i then there's there's more to that which is you know what are the key considerations for international relocations and how to assess so i'm not sure if we cover that now or maybe we come back to it later um, I think we can come back to that together uh, later because when we look at the Americas as a whole, after we dive through, um, we're sure. going to go through Brazil. Next will be Mexico, and then we're going to go up to yep. the um, U.S. and then Canada. Um, then I think we can pull back and take a full picture of you. And I'd love oh. to actually have the audience submit questions to live now uh, so that we can address those and actually provide any comments to those. I would wrap up finally just with Brazil, um, just to highlight how massive of a country it really is. Um, it's the 12th largest economy in the world, just just right off the bat. So it's a really, 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 really big uh, economy uh, and producer. And while there are a lot of international companies that are based in Brazil that are bringing foreign talent in, there's also an incredibly huge amount of locally based companies that are bringing in talent as well. And that talent is not only just from the Americas or Canada, a lot of it is intra-Latin America as well. So folks moving from other areas, um, locations, um, Chile is a common one as well, going into Brazil. And um, I, I wanted to highlight some of the locations. You can see here on the right side of the map, some of the more well-known companies and where they're based. And, and while I sh shared with you before where um, Sao Paulo is now, those locations are not exclusive for where operations are. So you can see Samsung, Selpa, uh, even FCA, etc. Um, a lot of these companies are based in 
different look Brazil. And what that means for your expats is actual travel travel times. It also means resources, um, how if you're moving a family that has children for international schooling, what access do they have if in they're, they're the far west parts of Brazil, where most of the international schools are kind of the southeast parts of Brazil. Um, do you have extended business trips? Uh, um, do you have uh, people that are based there full time and kind of community based living in the sense of their children are in one city and they work at another location and come back for the weekends, which is not um, not uncommon. I'm going to move on and to go to talk about Mexico. Um, now, from Mexico, it's uh, a very unique situation as well. Um, things to know about is that um, in terms of business across the country, there are multiple locations, not just Mexico City. Um, there's a huge amount of business in Monterrey. Um, and it's important to know that the reason why this happens is because there are VAT or tax incentives from a commercial standpoint that really helps to support border towns or different locations throughout Mexico. So companies prefer to be in these locations lower VAT and a lower kind of expense on on taxes. Um, some of the challenges, especially for Mexico, is, is really, again, kind of the, the expectations aspect of it. Um, what you see is people expect for, especially coming from North America, uh, Mexico to be less expensive than their home country or their, their, their state. In often cases, it's not. Um, so expenses and rent are much higher than they think it would actually be in Mexico. Uh, while they think Mexico should be cheap, um, living costs, uh, rent accommodation, those kind of things necessarily are not, especially in the expat areas where people tend to move into. Um, also, at the same point, for Mexico, uh, private and international schools are pretty much the only option for expats that are relocating into the area. And this is really important to consider because Mexico, from a trend perspective, has had a lot of the digital nomads moving in. So either into the Yucatan Peninsula or into, um, you know, the, the nice, I guess, the nicer vacation spots where people love to go to, like Cancun, etc. Um, the, they call it the Maya Riviera, right? Um, those locations are ideal from a living standpoint in terms of uh, like a digital nomad or people that are moving into the country. But when companies are starting to move employees like Mexico City or even in Monterrey, um, they need to be aware that the expectations on cost of living is going to be a lot higher than expected, especially when you start factoring in those schooling aspects and also those communities and expat communities and those type of things. So it's very different dynamic from what you may have experienced when you travel versus actually living there. Uh, some other trends as well that I can mention for Mexico is that the actual pesos has appreciated a lot, like more than 20% against the U.S. dollar. Um, so things have not only been expensive from a rent and um, kind of expat life perspective, but also the pesos is getting more expensive. So if you're converting U.S. dollar or U.S. payrolls into local pesos, that's going to affect uh, people's cost of living and their purchasing power as well. Um, the last one here, and it got kind of snuck on the bottom here, um, and I just pull that up real quick for everyone to see, but um, the item for Mexico to watch out for is really that it's not a DIY market. Uh, and I know a lot of programs are based around supporting employees as much as possible in terms of making their relocation efficient. Uh, but when it comes to Mexico, there's so many areas to navigate that makes it really difficult if you don't don't have a local guide. And this is, for example, if you're talking about real estate, if you're talking about moving into the, uh, finding your apartment and rents and stuff like that, but it also means shipping your goods as well, because trying to navigate customs, I know a lot of Californians think they can just load up a U-Haul and drive across the border. That is absolutely not recommended. Um, clearing customs through Mexico on yourself, on your own, is not easy. Driving through um, cross border is, is not recommended at all. So I would say the thing to watch out for is that while you may have experienced Mexico personally as a vacation destination or, or a, a wonderful place to visit, um, when you're living there as an expatriate, there are things to consider like cost of living and also that you need a support community that can help you to settle in efficiently into the area because just trying to do it your own uh, is going to be a little bit difficult. 
If we look at Mexico as well in terms of uh, a breakdown from what kind of companies we can see that are in there, um, there are a lot of companies that are working throughout the country. So again, it's not just Mexico City, but you can see these these prominent areas. Um, the borders tend to be more about um, it's either technology. You can see the list of companies here. We have G, Honeywell, Bose, Panasonic. Um, it's also a lot of medical industry as well in these border states. If you go down to the middle of the country, you have more of the mining, um, you have more of the kind of the minerals and uh, et cetera. And then on the eastern side, it's a lot more of an industry that is focused on automotive. And you'll have companies like Cat, et cetera, and Mercedes um, are, that are out there. There's also another really big um automotive area in the southern southern parts of mexico too uh and puebla and it's uh, you see companies like audi uh volkswagen etc that have uh, massive operations in those locations as well so I, I think the other thing is to be aware of is that when you're relocating people into mexico it's not just one location it's across the entire country and when you go to those different areas again resources can be very different the, the styles that um, people are able to accommodate in terms of living quality, um, education resources, access, et cetera, are, are all very different. So I know it's very easy to get into a expectation that, oh, they're going to Mexico, so this is what we need to know about Mexico. But really take the time to know and understand what city they're going into Mexico, and what part of the country they're going into, and really reflect on how that may influence the employee's lifestyle, their family, et cetera, that are moving into those regions. And by knowing that, you can help provide the resources for them in those locations. Mm. Okay. Um, next up, we'll take a look at, at the U.S. Um, the U.S. obviously um, has a very, very big domestic uh, program and, and uh, market for relocations. Probably one of the biggest uh, in the world in terms of volume. So the people that are moving state to state in between the United States is, is really in some companies, that's their entire program where international, they may, may only have a dozen or so folks and it's not the real focus. But things to know about for the U.S. is first and foremost that it is a very mature domestic market. And this often takes priority. Um, and that means in terms of volume, you'll have um, the focus being on these locations, getting the jobs done, getting the relocations completed. And it, it it's almost like a an energy suck, for lack of a better word, because when you're focusing exclusively on the U.S., it's very difficult to put that attention and energy into locations and understand, oh, well, what state are they moving into Mexico? And instead of saying they're just moving to Mexico and understanding those um, aspects. So keep that in the back of your mind is that to to um, not get absorbed in what's happening only in the U.S. markets because um, in the Latin American markets and even Canadian markets, um, the relocations also have a huge impact on operations. And may they, may, they may be fewer in volume, but they still require a lot of attention and support through that. Um, at the same time as well, for folks that are moving people into the United States, that in mind that when you're looking at support, when you're looking at um, suppliers that can be reliable, if their primary focus is on supporting a domestic market, when those volumes surges happen, they may not be there to help to support on those international fronts, or they may not be the first priority in terms of settling those um, those relocations. So just keep that in mind that the, the volume really impacts the United States because it's so big. Um, some of the challenges that we see in the United States is, first and foremost, again, it's kind of like expectations, and it's the reverse of, of uh, what we talked about previously. Here in the U.S., it's easy, uh, and they expect it to be an easy relocation coming in, um, whether it's because of its majority English-speaking country, uh, um, whether it's a situation where the infrastructure or locations tend to be more mature in terms of people coming in and out of. Um, however, for most expats that are moving in, myself as well, uh, it's not that clear cut. It's not that easy. Um, the U.S. is a very big country and each state does have very different cultures and different expectations. And when you're moving someone, you're moving their life. You're not just moving their goods. You're not just giving them a job. You're giving them a new life. And when they're trying to adjust into that experience, it's really important to understand that 
it's not going to be as easy as you would expect or they would expect it. So you really have to set that expectation. Um, the other challenge as well, especially this is more for international um, arrivals into the United States, is the healthcare system. Um, and Andy, I'm sure we could talk about this forever. Uh, being expats and being outside of the U.S. and you, you yourself not not being from the U.S., um, it's it's a very, very hard system to navigate, which perhaps folks that have been here their entire life or a very extended amount of time you to it and navigated it quite well, but especially for expats that are coming in, um, this is something that is very confusing. It's very complex. It's very expensive. And um, whether the companies provide traditional programs, whether it's in obviously health insurance and those type of things, there may need to be support and understanding, hey, this is the difference how things are done in the U.S. in terms of appointments and costs and deductibles and all those type of things and co-pays that do not exist in other countries. And that can be a challenge to understand what it what is actually covered. Um, the next thing in terms of trends that we see for the United States, um, one of the bigger ones that a lot of folks are talking about is actually the reluctance to move. Um, very interesting enough that because what's happened in the last couple of years with the interest rates, especially in the real estate arena, the have been so low that folks have been able to lock in 3%, 2.6, 2 2.5% mortgage rates. And now with them going up to 6, 7%, they're not willing to give that up. And it's it's not only just a situation where they're not willing to, they may actually not be able to give that up. Because if you double your insur your uh, mortgage rate, that means you can afford far less, um, a much different kind of accommodation, different kind of neighborhood, etc. Um, and when you're relocating the costs behind that are a huge factor so that's one of the things i've heard a lot of people talking about across the united states whether it's um west coast etc through different regionals um the comment is always how do we get people to move with interest being interest rates being so high um and one of the conversations that i was at recently was can the company help and aid in purchasing points to reduce those percentages so as as some of you have have that experience when you get a mortgage in the United States, the banks do offer opportunities where you can pay a little bit more to get a better percentage. And the discussion around that was, can the company's help is a opportunity to provide benefits or a, be more of an attractive offer to employees that are coming? Because the standard, you know, we'll provide your move, we'll provide your relocation, or we'll give you a lump sum is pretty much a given. But when it comes to those unique opportunities, that may be something that could really make the difference in terms of an employee accepting the job. Mm -hmm. Another trend as well is that um, shipments are from, and this is from the perspective of the transferee, um, they're getting smaller, um, they're getting faster, they're moving across the country much faster than they did in the past, and they're becoming less of a priority. Uh, and this is really a qu quite important um, to be aware of because this is going to affect a lot of packages and, and how the packages you design. And um, Andy, don't tell our bosses, but I'll probably shoot my foot here. Um, this really reflects flex on your lump sum programs uh, and your cash back policies. So if you have programs where you'll give, you know, an 80% back or, you know, 70, 30 back to the employee, if they don't decide to move, they can have that, that lump sum cash allowance. In a lot of cases, that's what they're deciding to do. And there's opportunities for companies that would come in that would help them to discard and donate, uh, that would help them to sell goods, um, and then relocate with just, you know, the bare minimum of what they need. And they'll buy it again when they get there. Or that also would affect what they're looking for for temp accommodation in terms of furniture, uh, being fully furnished units, those type of things. So mm -hmm. that's a trend that we see happening. And quite frankly, whenever an employee is given that option to have cash instead of paying for a move, and they see how much it does cost to move, more often than not, they're choosing, well, I'll take the cash allowance and I'll figure out what to do with this stuff. Um, so that's that's an important one to keep an eye on. If, if, if I can if I can just uh, jump in there, there's, there's a couple of things that I think also contribute to that. I think, um, you know, I haven't been doing this for a while and seeing the average age of people moving internationally kind of going down. Uh, you know, it used to be people moving with, you know, furniture that's big, heavy items that have belonged in the family for a long time. And now it's more about IKEA. So people are less likely to move IKEA items. You know, they're not precious treasured family belongings as they used to. Um, and just the, the younger generation, 
generation, they're more into the gadgets, you know, as long as they're connected, they have their TV, they have, you know, all their bits and bobs rather than, you know, the, the, the big pieces of furniture, then, you know, that, that seems to be something that is more, more preferred to, well, younger generation, certainly to myself. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's 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 something that's that's kind of shifted over the years. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 that's reflected also in policies where there there are also core flex programs where they could choose to have a shipment, or they could have more home leave, or they could have a flight for their spouse or their partner or a girlfriend, um, those kind of things, or support you know moving their pet uh, instead of having a shipment, they could have their pet um, transportation covered, which is you know domestically in the U.S. maybe it's not so difficult. Whereas you're coming internationally, um, I can testify it's very difficult and very 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 expensive. Um, um, so those are options where employees will feel more heard and valued if you're oper op offering opportunities uh, beyond just the simple scopes of, hey, we'll cover your move, but, you know, giving them allowances uh, to choose from that really impact their experience. And um, lastly, for the U.S., um, things to watch out for, um, definitely housing prices and interest rates. Um, that's an important one. That's at the forefront of everyone's mind, uh, especially those who bought recently, I'd say in the last maybe three years. Um, and talk to your real estate agents, talk to your brokers and the companies that you work with in, in the verticals of uh, home sales. But that's one that is really important because a lot of people, when they bought, not only did they buy at a low interest rate, but they may have bought their homes at an inflated rate. Um, Boise, Idaho comes to mind when a lot of a lot of folks were moving in there with a lot of cash and the the, the prices of homes were just going sky high. Um, Texas is another one. Um, Dallas homes just four or five years ago or were, were literally half the cost. Five hundred thousand dollar home now is going for two two point six, and obviously that depends on different markets. But this is a really really impactful situation where people are saying, well, my interest rate is very really low, but also I bought the house at the peak. So I'm not going to sell it right now because I'm going to wait till I can actually recoup or something like that. Um, so those are definitely impacting decisions, at least the conversations that we've been privy to. Uh, um, next up, when we look at the spread of the United States. Um, this is um, many familiar company logos I'm sure you've seen before. Maybe a bit surprised. Um, this is the spread of companies sizes in the states where they have uh, headquarters. Um, so you can see, for example, in Florida, we got Jabal there. Uh, in Texas, we got AT&T. In California, it's HP. Um, so this is based on employee size. Um, where where the most of the employees are, and it's an interesting um, view to look at in terms of understanding where people are going, what kind of locations people are moving to, and how that drives those type of jobs. So obviously, in the East Coast, we have a lot of tech, we have a lot of pharmaceutical. On the West Coast as well, California and Northern California as well up into Oregon, we have a lot of um, tech as well, but we also have um, like Nike is up there, Starbucks is up there, um, a lot of companies uh, as well. Uh, so Texas is not just oil and gas. Um, there's a lot of other companies moving in as well in terms of techs too. So it's important to see like how does that impact your relocations, the type of relocations and where people that you can expect will be going into. Um, next up, let's dive into finally Canada. Um, it's taken us a while to get all the way up there, but I'm glad we uh, we've made it so far. Um, so things to know about Canada um, is that recently, since pretty much 2020, uh, interprovincial relocations has really led the lead in the relocation market. Uh, and this means there is a huge amount of people that are moving across the country from east to west. Um, some of the challenges that they that we see in Canada um, is getting used to the extreme cold weather. And this is for folks that are moving to, like, for example, Toronto, etc. Um, it's all fun maybe the first year or the second second year. Um, but when folks are not used to this and, and have moved into it, it is a very different change in the way of life. Um, and some sometimes that can be difficult to adapt to. Um, the lack of social services was quite interesting as well as some of the challenges that was often mentioned for Canada. Uh, it seems like it's a more you've got to figure out yourself take you know, and find opportunity to navigate uh, what resources are available. But this was an impact on in, uh, relocations into the country for folks that were looking for more support in terms of social services. Uh, and then finally, finding affordable housing was a 
really big one. Um, Toronto is a, a notoriously expensive market these days, um, and finding affordable housing and the cost of living in Canada is often much, much higher than people would typically expect it would be. Uh, so really looking at that COLA data can be super important. Um, some of trends that are interesting is uh, Nova Scotia has been the fastest growing uh, location where people actually have been moving into. Um, home prices are influencing fright, the flight from expensive areas like Toronto. So you have a lot of people similar to what we had in the U.S., California, um, moving out into the Midwest, into um, locations that were traditionally less populated. In Canada, it's the same thing. Um, Ontario still ranks high high as where people are moving to and from. Uh, and funny enough, the province of Alberta, that's pretty much right smack in the middle of Canada, um, has had the highest amount of relocations uh, in the last couple of years. So there's a lot of people moving into that area. Um, and that's quite similar to for the, for the U.S. as well, that uh, people are leaving the big cities, the small cramped apartments and getting to um, locations where they can have a little bit more land, bigger home and less of a cost. And finally, the thing to watch out for for Canada uh, is the cost of living. And, and this catches people a lot by surprise. Um, they think that um, it will not be as expensive as it is going to be. And often uh, it can be more expensive than some of the locations people are moving from in the United States. So just keep that in mind when you're doing those analytics and looking at the opportunities for employees that uh, they need to be aware of what they're, they're jumping into. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the spread of Canada in terms of the, the companies that are out here, um, there is quite a, a big spread. A lot of them are local, uh, uh, domestically Canadian companies. So you do see a lot of, again, intra-Canadian moves is, is a really um, pick, a, a pick up. Um, and also high net worth individuals uh, moving within Canada is a, um, a trend as well that's happening. So um, if we where that's pretty much all the locations. And Andy, you, you asked a few questions about um, understanding relocations from a broad America's perspective. Was there any other questions that were kind of more summarizing and, and looking at um, information across the board? Um, there were some, well, there was a few questions there for, for Mexico and, and the U.S. that we kind of, you know, skipped past. But uh, for, for the U.S., I think is is more pertinent. Um, is is there any increase or decrease that we're seeing in U.S. movement right now? I would say decrease. Um, decrease. Well, well, I mean, if you look at the ebb and flow, right, we had COVID and then the a lot of assignments were put on pause. Uh, they weren't canceled. They were just put on pause. Um, and then the year after, pretty much 2022 is where we saw most of those being released and being completed. So a lot of those opportunities that were on hold were Activated and now this year, it is slower. But if you're comparing a year-on-year -year analysis, it's not a quite clear picture because you had this massive surge from 2022. But that was really a lot of the hold from the pandemic. So for 2023, yes, it's slower. Um, the the numbers I've been hearing are about 30 percent from the business last year. But if we mm -hmm. try to take that in reflection of any kind of normality, if we look at it at a five of a five-year spread uh, would be a little bit less, but the market is much slower this year. Sure. Yeah, I would agree from where I is. That is, lies true here as well. Uh, what, what are the top misconceptions about relocations within or to North America? Very, very good question. Um, do you mean specifically the United States or both Canada and no, well, North the US? America, I, I guess. So Mexico through to Canada. So coming from an international perspective, uh, I I expect so. Well, it says either to or within. So um, you know, I think it's probably easier to to say to from external going into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I mean, what what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that it goes back to the the comment that was on the slide about the U.S. as things to watch out for, um, yeah. is that it's not as easy as people would expect it to be. Um, expats need a lot more hand-holding um, mm -hmm. in different areas. And I can explain, um, for example, uh, there was one family that moved out into Pennsylvania, um, but they were from Latin America. Um, so they're very used to being in a 
a culture of community and a culture where you could actually have access to people and resources within a very short distance. And that community was, you know, in, I guess it took, it took form of having friends coming over or stopping by or, you know, going out to um, restaurants or local shops or those kind of things and enjoying time with friends and family and having that really community centered focus. But when they moved out into the East Coast, the U.S., they moved out to an area that was much, much more. And it was a, a location where people tend to stick to themselves. So it was very isolating. Um, mm. There wasn't a lot of shops. There wasn't a lot of engagement where they could go out and socialize. And like New York City was a couple hour drive away. So it wasn't a, a, you know, a solution to go maybe for a long weekend. OK, sure. But your day to day life. So that was a challenge because it was so isolating and they weren't expecting that it was going to be be like that. But from the company's perspective, it's like, well, it's, you know, it's Pennsylvania. It's it's the United States. Like, like here's your package. Get going um, and mm. you, you'll buy a house, you'll get a car and you'll have a good life. Um, but for those values that and those experiences that uh, the family was used to, they did not necessarily have those in Pennsylvania and just going through that cultural adjustment was a huge shock because just the isolation, um, the loneliness, the inability to connect with yeah. other folks just led to the whole experience as being rather negative rather than positive. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I guess by and large, it, it's, it's not even, well, it's, it's joint combination of where the individual has come from and their cultural background, but also the individual because some people enjoy their own company and some people might like to go to Pennsylvania and suddenly they've got the space and not having such a crowd around them from where they come from and you know they might appreciate it so but it, it's uh, probably more often than not the experience that, that you've mentioned you know people are coming with families because it's not just you yourself you've got to try and keep your family happy as well for this for this whole experience to be to to work um so an, an, another question which i think you touched upon as well um was what are the current relocation trends in full relocation packages versus oh. lump sum and are people satisfied with lump sum very good question. Um, I, I would also like to just um, let the audience know that please submit questions or comments in the chat and, and we'll reference those because I'd love to hear. We've, we have over 400 people that we're uh, planning to attend today. So I'd love to hear your feedback and your comments. Um, obviously, what we're sharing today is a collection of conversation, interviews and discussions with our clients and with people around the world to get an inside view to share with you. Um, but your view is absolutely valuable in, in understanding um, different perspectives across the globe as well, especially in the Americas. Um, Andy, to answer that question, and um, again, this is this is general general um, assessments and understandings. Everybody's different. Everyone has a different experience, um, especially like what you said about um, the family that was moving into Pennsylvania. Um, however, the ability for folks to have a core flex model where they have absolute essential relocation services that are needed to make the relocation happen and these are the cores um, you know often they fall under the housing they fall under the immigration if you're international uh, and they fall under our tax scheme as well um, those are core those are important those are kind of a given right um, but the flexible ones are super important and the more flexible that they are that attribute to needs of a diverse employee population is the better and so this means for example Looking after not just providing um, you know leave of absence or or home return tickets to the employee and their wife, but also to their partner or to their girlfriend or to their boyfriend or even to elderly parents. Um, and some companies that is a huge concern for international folks coming from Asia, Asia, particularly in Asia. Uh, where it may have elderly parents, um, that that just option to choose, hey, if I don't want to do a household goods shipment um, and I can now have an extra flight for my parents to come visit or I could go visit them, that makes a difference for the pets as well. Um, also, a really huge uptick is in the emotional wellness and how do employees look after that. But the really difficult question that people are finding and how they answer that question is the diversity element. Because if they want to provide support 
support for employees emotional wellness they also have to understand and accept not accept but address the diverse population of employees that they have and how do they match that how do they meet that so what kind of programs could be provided to do that um, where are those access points and you know where are those opportunities for improvement um, we went through trends pretty much last year and the year before where a lot of Comp and Ben folks, as well as uh, the mobilities, were uh, were looking at policy terminology, and how do we extend terminology to be more inclusive? And, and while that's super important, um, you know, lexicology is is one element to make someone feel that they're not being ostracized. Mm. Uh, but there's also an opportunity for programs to be. Um, more tailored to a diverse population. And as your point, Andy, is the people who are relocating are getting younger. Uh, and that's just because of the nature of the world we live in, the nature of opportunities. Um, people are much more, have more access to take a job over, you know, across the states or another country where in the past they may have not had the privilege or the opportunity to even have access to that uh, knowledge. So that's definitely changing. Uh, and when you have that changing um, on a global trend that's a little bit outside America's, we have something happening in the relocation space, which is really impacting how people move. It's intra-regional moves. So before COVID, we had a lot of internationals. We had a lot of North American, um, European-driven relocations across the globe. But now we're seeing a lot of intra-region. So that's intra-APAC. It's intra-Europe. It's intra-Americas. Um, and looking for talent more locally based and easy easier to transfer in between that. But what that means is now if you're a mobility program that's based in, let's say, you know, um, Illinois or you're, you're based in uh, New York, you're now moving employees from Chennai to Mumbai. Now, how do you understand the differences between those? Because, yes, it's India, but it's two completely different cities, two completely different locations and cultures, etc. cetera. Um, and then you have that also from intra-Asia. If you're moving someone from Tokyo and moving them into Hong Kong, what is that experience? going to be like and how do you address that population that's really becoming much more diverse mm. yeah no that the 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 the, the, the there's many uh different combinations there that we we could be discussing for the rest of the day so <laughs> yeah um <laughs> all, all right there was there, there was that question that um we decided to come back to uh so that was once again what are the key considerations for international relocations and how to assess? Hmm. How to assess the the employee, or does it say? Does it specifically? It does. It doesn't say. So, uh, I guess it, it it might be to do with the uh, with with allowance or just you know the overall experience, perhaps. Um, you know, it's it's is it an individual that you're moving? You know, a lot of policies that companies have, uh, they will vary depending on if the assignee or the transferee with the company, the employee, um, if they are single, if they're married, if they have a family, um, their their seniority and you know ranking within the company. Um, so that's usually where it starts. And then, you know, HR within the company kind of has that, you know, that stepping stone up the up the ladder for, you know, who gets what and how much. And obviously those with, with children who are moving half their shipment of, it consists of toys, um, then, you know, they, they need a bit more volume and a bit more leeway uh, because, you know, keeping the family happy is, is, as we know, essential to making the transfer for work and, you know, not have people wanting to go back home after six or eight months. Um, so, you, you know, I think making sure that you can provide uh, not just for the move itself, but the things around the move, and Michael's been discussing it a lot, you know, it's um, it's to do with helping them settle into this new culture. You know, what can you do uh, within your company or get assistance from, you know, someone like Arpin or whoever is moving you, you know, in, in terms of, you know, orientation trips, settling in. Um, or, or you know, school assistance, because when you have 
the spouse and the rest of the family feel like, you know, they've, they're, they're being shown the love as well. It's not just the person who's going into the office every day. Uh, you know, mm. they they feel like they're being looked after as well. Then they're going to be a lot happier from day one. And that means that the person who's going into the office is not going to be receiving calls or what's messages every five minutes saying oh i don't know what to do and i don't know where to go and you know i'm not happy and they can crack on with work and you know have less stress and just just kind of settle into the job quicker as well yeah i mean in terms of the assessment right it's really difficult i mean to have a program i, I think the hardest part is management of programs that are too complex and that's always been the kind of the the roadblock to creating a diverse program because how do you do how do you manage a diverse program with limited resources and if you start doing point based programs who's going to manage these who's going to help to support a kind of core flex program but the other aspect of it is too is like how do you choose an employee and and um, those are questions that business units are now asking mobility departments is, well, how do I make, you know, I have candidates, how do I choose what candidate would be a good person to relocate? There are companies out there that provide assessment tools. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I would say is just steer clear of, of basically pigeonholing people uh, and be careful of really um, trying to set up a system that may be um, a little bit too restrictive because you can use like personality assessments and those type of things if we're mm. looking at how to assess what employee is right and and um, there are there are companies that do that but their goal is to say hey this is the the personality traits of this employee who is going so that you can identify what needs they would have and therefore make recommendations on your relocation program that would help to support them when they're in transition. So it's not a limiting assessment, it's more of a uh, actualizing and finding mm -hmm. out what, what uh, opportunities there are to help support them. Um, so that's a little bit different. Um, if you're talking about assessments in terms of programs, um, it's, it's great to have colleagues that you can reference, like a community like this. Uh, and I haven't seen the chat yet, but I would encourage uh, individuals to um, put their comments in. Some of the questions that we had as well that were, I wanted to open more to the community that uh, were asked were, for example, like finding the right partners. Um, what are some key considerations for international reloads and how to assess them? Like that's really looking at how do you provide, uh, the question was asking about how do you, how do you um, select the right suppliers? Um, other one, another question was about uh, policy and programs and what's the difference between skill-based skill, uh, skill -based approaches and versus and how does that impact things that uh, a little bit outside of our scope, but um, the whole relocation VNI, um, the aspects of applicability, um, and what that question was really getting at is when you talk about skill base, you're talking about experience, but not necessarily from an educational academic perspective. But most locations around the world, if you're coming as foreign talent, require first and foremost that you have that academic background, whether it's moving into the Netherlands on a talent visa, whether it's moving into China, um, even in Brazil, et cetera, the employees need to prove a certain level of academics. But if you're looking at a skill-based approach, how does that affect that? Um, I'd open these questions up to, to the audience as well to provide comments. Uh, and uh, feedback as well to understand like what kind of programs can be more conductive of a successful relocation and how can that impact um, relocations into the Americas. Do yeah. we have any comments in the chat? I may mean, take a look into that. Yeah. We've, oh, we've, we we've had a, a couple of questions here that, that I've actually uh, I've, I've pulled across. So the first one uh, from Rita Sahai. Thank you, Rita, for your question. Um, have you seen furniture allowance being given to an employee does not move large pieces of furniture, especially in the US, I think specifically to the US. If yes, how do they structure it? Um, so, I mean, I, I can answer this one. I think, I think what you mean is, do you have or have we seen um, any, any companies who want to move their, their employees and state that they will not move the furniture, I think is maybe what you're saying. Um, largely, no. I wouldn't say that I've seen anything like that. Uh, typically, an allowance is given based on a volume or a container size or a weight for the US, of course, obviously. Um, and that that's pretty specific and, and restrictive in what the allowance will allow. Um, so what they might do is once in a while say, 
you know, we have we have a particular company that will say, we will not move your washing machine. It will for whatever, you know, it's just stipulated in the policy um, or, you know, quite often they'll just manage expectations. You know, we do not move your cars or your skis or motorbikes, anything like that, just to prevent issues and additional costs and, you know, make sure people understand from the offset. So, um, you know, I, I usually it's based on that volume or weight allowance and as long as they're within it and you know they they follow the policy otherwise so that's that's usually good to go okay anything to add to that michael or do you want to have a look at the next question yeah let's take a look at the next question i think you answered that quite well okay thank you oh hi andy welcome back oh hello andy <laughs> okay so the next one came from kim isaac thank you kim um, a furniture allowance versus household goods move is something we're trying to figure out how to do in U.S. government regulated moves. It's less expensive, but it seems that it but there seems to be no way to make that cost allowable or chal or chargeable to the government. Any ideas are appreciated. Yeah, Kim, it depends if you're talking about from a GSA perspective or from a military in terms of what is actually allowed. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. If you want to look at policy, I have a QR code up here um, that we can you can reach out and contact us. Um, and then we can get you a, a detailed answer to that, because I think that's specific uh, against a policy. Um, but if you're looking for whether to weigh giving an employee an opportunity to have a furniture allowance for rental versus moving their goods, um, do keep in mind that you may have exception cases where people are asking for storage. Um, so they would like to have the rental furniture because they get the new fancy furniture and it's all well designed and it matches everything and the spouse is really happy but then they may not be willing to depart with you know grandma's cabinets and stuff like that so just keep in mind if you are offering a furniture allowance that there's a um a nod if, if like a better term a nod to understanding um a policy about any kind of storage and it could be one or the other it could be simply like either you take a furniture allowance or you allow for a shipment um, but if you take a furniture rental allowance then it does not cover the storage of your card goods those kind of things um, but if you'd like uh, please just scan that qr code there um, and we can get back to you kim with those specific details on terms of a gsa or military okay the last one the most the one that's just come in um from anand parad thank you anand uh lease Lease breakage is also a big cost for people who are asked to move within a month. Are companies providing lease breakage allowance for people coming from international locations and for U.S. or Canada domestic relocations? That's a good question. You are more qualified than I for that one, Michael. That's a very good question. Um, I think the audience is very qualified because that is going to be dependent on many situations and company policies. However, typically, if it is a company forced move in the sense that the company is requesting that the employee move and it's not they're raising their hand asking to move to a new location, then in that case, absolutely, the company would cover those costs of that early termination uh, because it's being company directed. Again, it, it depends on each policy. Some do, some, some do not. Um, but uh, And also, do you have a remote work policy? Do you have a phase out where the employee could um, spend the rest of their time in that unit uh, for for example, until they move to the new location working remote, well, I think it really depends. But I guess a, a baseline descriptor is from conversations that I've heard is that companies would cover these costs, whether it's a lease termination, et cetera, if it was a company directed move and it wasn't based on the employee's choice that they they had to move. Does that help answer yeah. the question a little bit? Yeah. Can I can I just ask something, Michael? Um, you know, from parts of the world that I've lived in, not the Americas, um, there is typically something called a diplomatic clause, which is in a lot of people's tenancy agreements. And that basically states, you know, a lot of people here in the UAE, UAE specifically are, are expats. So, you know, if they are asked by their company to relocate and go to the office somewhere else or they're leaving for, you know, work reasons, they can prove it, then they are allowed to 
you know, get out of that lease contract that they are in. Is there anything like that over in, in the Americas or, you know, the U.S. at all? Really depends on the actual contract. I mean, there's definitely stipulations that you could have. Have um, for companies that have corporate housing, particularly, they'll put in agreements for terminations. They could do swap outs. For example, they move another employee in, etc. Um, okay. So really, it's possible. Yes, there's, but it there's on variations, what. but nothing specific. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a private landlord, it's probably less likely. If yeah. you're in a, a corporate situation and you have long term agreements, then it's it's possible to negotiate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for for me, um, you know. I obviously don't work in the Americas, so, you know, I've, I've sent a lot of shipments over there, but to get an insight specifically from Michael into, you know, all the things that that, that make it tick and make, uh, you know, decisions very important and relevant, you know, it, it, it kind of helps me to know what to advise my HR clients that I'm dealing with on a daily basis for what to what what to look at and you know be looking out for um so you know for that i i i'm you know i'm, I'm educated thank you michael i would say from from a, a former expat's perspective uh, especially when moving into the americas try to avoid making the assumption that everything's the same uh, and that cultural support is only for those folks that are moving internationally because uh, california is very different from new york Jersey is very different from Texas uh, and adjusting into these communities. Like I said before, you're moving someone's life, uh, not just giving them a job. And when you have that opportunity, it's not so much about the, t the tangibles. Um, it, when I moved here, I, I had over a decade experience in relocating. I've done the real estate. I've done the immigration. I've done the household goods. Uh, I've done it internationally in European and Asian markets. I had my checklist. I had my calendar. I was like, let's go. We're ready to go. And then when we got here, I was like, oh, my goodness. There were so many things that were missing. There were so many gaps in between. There was amazing suppliers that were doing all the tactical elements for me, but there was nobody there that was helping and coaching me through the experience and the situation. My husband being international, uh, us coming back, re relocating back to the United States as a returning expat after 15 years abroad. Um, and it was really funny. We were actually having conversations with friends in the Netherlands, which was an, an Indian and Chinese couple that moved to the Netherlands and asking about their adaptation, their experience. And then our friend from Congolese friend and a friend from uh, Geneva in, in Geneva uh, and vice versa in Singapore. And we were having to go to our personal network across the world that couldn't really match where we lived, but to identify a lot of these intangible aspects of relocating that don't get addressed through suppliers and when you get your checklist and you're putting together together your relocation that's all good but make sure that you have an option to check off for the employee's wellness and what programs do you have to support that and i'd really really encourage don't make the mistake to assume that the suppliers will do that for you um, because suppliers are experts in their vertical and their lane and they're going to you know, 100% passionate. They're great, amazing people. They care about your employees, but they're not equipped with the skill set to help to mentor, to coach, and to take care of an employee's wellness. Understand that there's a difference between that, and that could really impact your programs going into the future. Not just saying, hey, what supplier do we need to get on board to make things go great? It's looking at what programs can we address the needs that are not being covered in a typical relocation.